I am beyond honored to present this morning our keynote speaker, Ijeoma Oluo. With a language that is bold, unapologetic, funny, and fine-tuned, she offers a better way by showing what is possible when connections are made across a divide. She's a writer, internet yeller, and speaker whose book, So You Want to Talk About Race, is in the top five for Time Magazine lists of books to read about race. She was named one of the Roots' 100 most influential African Americans by the and given the 2017 Humanist Feminist Award by the American Humanist Association. She has also been named one of the most influential people by C in Seattle by Seattle Magazine, but I just want to say that her home is in Snohomish County. <laughs> so, welcome, Ijeoma. Can y'all hear me all right? I honestly, it is surreal to be speaking 20 feet away from the old drug emporium I used to work at <laughs> as a freshman in high school. Um, it's good to be back in Linwood. And even though my old high school is now a Costco, I still do have a lot of great memories of growing up here. I am a lifelong Seattle area light. I guess I have to say that here. I usually just say Seattle light, but y'all know now. <laughs> so I uh, have to be a little more accurate. But yes, I did grow up in Linwood. I went to Linwood High School. Um, is the mascot still the chimera? Which, why? <laughs> You know, I was probably a junior before I realized it wasn't a lion. I just thought it was a really weird lion for the longest <laughs> time. I, and I don't think I was alone in that. Um, Y'all get getting a little fancy uh, with the school mascots. Anyways, my name is Ijoma Oluo, and I write on social issues, primarily on issues of race, also issues of gender, mental health, and this is what I've dedicated my life to. This means that every day I get up, I get online, I look around at the world, I look at what horrible garbage fire things are happening, and then I check my inbox, and there will be someone saying, would you like to write 700 words about this horrible garbage fire thing that's happening? And I'm like, yay, <laughs> that sounds like fun. Um, and then I did that once for like a whole year and I made a book out of it, which was, if anyone followed me on social media during that time, you could guess at how much fun I was having. Um, there's, a, there's a difference between work you enjoy and work you find rewarding. And I don't think I learned that at its core until I started writing about race. Um, I definitely find my work rewarding. And I definitely do not enjoy a single minute of it. There's this misperception that people of color love talking about race. That, you know, we wake up and we think, how can I make this about race today? <laughs> I'm going to, like, corner Jeff at the office and just, we're going we're gonna to have so much fun chatting about racism. <laughs> and in reality, usually if you're a person of color and you realize you have to talk to a white person about race, you sit there and you're like, oh, no, do I have to do this? Do I have to have this conversation? It's not going to go well. I don't want to. And then you have it or you don't, but no matter what, 
If anyone's having fun in those conversations, it's not us. And I've written a whole book about having these conversations and how to have more productive conversations. And it's kind of ironic to say that even though I wrote 80,000 words, 67,000 words about talking about race, that every time someone says to me, oh, we just really need to get together and talk, what we really need is more communication, I cringe. And I say, I don't want to do that. And I did title my book, So You Want to Talk About Race, but I was being generous because really it's so you've been dragged kicking and screaming to talk about race, or so you have to talk about race because you're dying. And that's really the reality with which we come to these discussions. People don't know quite what to say when I admit, or not even admit, but proclaim I am not in this to win over hearts and minds. I am not in a battle for hearts and minds. When I walk down the street, I know very well there's a percentage of the population that doesn't like me, that fears me, that may hate me, and I don't care. Every day, I hear from people, especially as someone who writes on these topics, and someone who has a lot of social media accounts, I hear from people who are sad and mad and outraged about what's happening to people of color. The people I hear from usually aren't actually people of color. We don't need to actually check in with each other about that. We know <laughs> we're sad, we're mad, we're outraged about what's happening to us. And I hear from people who are reaching out to me with love and empathy and sympathy. They want me to know, they care. And outside of really clogging up my notifications on social media, it does very little for me. What is happening to people of color in this country should outrage you. It should make you sad, it should make you mad. It's killing us. That's the least it could do. And you should love us. You should care about us as you would care about any other human being. But your rage will not fight for me. And your love will not shield me. When I'm trying to get my children to have equal education. I cannot take your rage to my parent-teacher conference. When I am pulled over by a police officer, I cannot pull your love out of my wallet with my ID. The focus on hearts and minds, the idea that we just need to be reaching out and explaining that we are human beings, that we are scared, that we deserve safety and love. The idea that we just haven't won over enough of white America yet, after over 400 years, is an idea that is too broad, and it is an idea that is way too small, and it's an idea that also manages to completely miss the point. There's been a lot of talk about what happened at Starbucks a couple, what, it feels like a year ago now, but a couple days ago, I'm assuming? Gosh. And people keep asking me, I've been, you know, I check my inbox and now, of course, Every third email now is some news outlet wanting me to comment on what happened at Starbucks. And I've done a couple of interviews on it. And every one asked me this question, which was, 
Uh, what did you think when you saw the video of these two black men being handcuffed and walked away? And my answer is, not much. Yeah, I had a, it felt like a punch in the stomach, shook my head. Honestly, I didn't even share it. it why? Because it's really common. Because this happens all the time. I'm more shocked by how shocked people were that it happened, than the fact that it did. When we look at what happened at a place like Starbucks, a lot of people were upset. A lot of people were saying, well, Starbucks is racist, boycott Starbucks, they have racist baristas. But is the problem actually that this manager was racist and therefore called the cop? had these men dragged out? Or is the problem that she knew she could? Is the problem that she knew that she was well within her rights, that it was part of her duty to keep these black men out? That she knew because she had done some similar actions before, that there would be no repercussions to having these men handcuffed to risk their lives. And she did risk their lives, not just their freedom. Because she didn't feel safe in their presence. What happened there is happening all over the country. In every institution we have in every business we have, in every school we have, everywhere that people of color interact in the public, we are being denied services. We are being denied care. We are being put at risk. We are being criminalized. And it is not because everyone in this country has hate in their hearts. If you were to ask the perpetrators of these injustices, if you were to ask the doctor who sends a black woman home when she complains of chest pains because he doesn't believe that she feels pain the same way that white people do, if he hated that woman, he would say no. If you were to ask the police officer who sees a black or brown man reach for his wallet and shoots him, if he woke up this morning thinking, I want to kill a person of color, he would say no. If you were to ask the teachers that are suspending black and brown kids at four times the rate of white kids, if they do not want those kids to have an education, if they do not think they deserve an education, they would say no. If I spent a year trying to win over one racist neighbor, and I have one in mind, and I was successful, what would that do for me? It would make my neighborhoods one twentieth more pleasant, perhaps. I'm not very social with my neighbors. If I was able to win over 20 racist neighbors and have them singing my praises about how great I am, had them saying they believe racism is bad, something should be done, what would that do for me? If you all joined me in this mission to go convince your neighbors that racism is bad and people of color are human beings, what would that do for me? In a country where the average black household has one thirteenth 
the net financial worth of the average white household? What does my neighbor looking at me with a smile instead of a frown do for me or for anyone in my community? The truth is that there are no amount of hearts and minds you can win over that we can take to the bank. Further, if you were to go out to any of your neighbors and ask them, what do you think of people of color? How many of them do you think would sit down and tell you, not a fan, don't like them? Probably not many. I mean, granted, I know those people exist. They all find me on Twitter. <laughs> and if I cannot win over my neighbor, if I just can't make it work, if I can't quite convince him, if I'm not charming enough, if I don't have the right arguments, does that mean I failed? Does that mean that my progress stops? The other day, I was talking with someone about the need for our major universities to invest in the science of fighting racism and racial oppression in our society. I was talking about the need to put money and resources behind fighting what is killing millions of Americans. And the man I was talking to lit up and said, oh, well, you'll be really happy to know now, he was younger than me, um, that nowadays, in, you know, in the college I went to at least, they mandate multicultural studies. And while I am definitely in favor of multicultural studies, his ability to know a little bit about where my parents came from is not what I was talking about. We have a cancer in this society. We have a cancer of racial oppression in this society that is putting black and brown people in prison at horrific rates, that is suspending our preschoolers from school at the age of four, that is causing people with black sounding names to be four times less likely to even be called for a job interview. It is robbing us of wealth, it is robbing us of security. It is robbing us of the ability to give our children futures. It's robbing us of our health. It is killing our babies in the womb. It is killing us in labor. It is giving us hypertension. It is the greatest sickness that this society has. And usually, when you have an illness that is ravaging entire populations, you try to find a way to solve it. You put experts behind it. You build entire departments around it. You spend billions of dollars. You do A-B tests. What's the most effective way to combat this symptom of racial oppression here? And we don't have that. What we have right now are people like me, who, because I have to live it every day, and I'm trying my best to survive, I'm compiling what I've been able to scrape together while also trying to raise my children and keep them safe and keep the rest of my family and community safe. And holding it forward and saying, 
this is the best we've got. It's like going to a cancer patient and saying, you've been battling cancer now for a couple of years. Can you please tell us how to cure it? And what is the sickness we are trying to treat? Systemic oppression is not actually about hearts and minds. Everyone here has already been won over. That's why you're here. You're dedicating your morning to talking about this. And yet pretty much everyone here is an active, even eager participant in systems of racial oppression. Everyone here is failing in their duty to combat racial oppression, where they have power to make measurable change. By the way, this is the thing I love to do, which is to start the morning by making everyone feel bad. This is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Systemic oppression only requires that you do nothing. Now, it will weaponize your hate. It will exploit your bias and your ignorance. Those are like bonuses. And, you know, occasionally it will manufacture some for you if it needs that cushion to justify itself. But you can go your whole life never uttering a racial slur and still be the perfect tool for racial oppression. You can go your whole life hugging and loving. You can even spend your life married to a person of color and still be a tool of racial oppression. All the system requires you to do is nothing. And so every day, I am inundated with the love that is coming from the hearts and minds that have already been won over. And all it does is clog my mentions. I mean, it's nice to know if you've had a bad day, that someone's thinking about you, but it doesn't actually stop what made your day bad in the first place, especially when we're talking about issues of race. Right now we have children of color who are growing up who are getting all the way through high school without seeing any examples of themselves as inventors, as leaders, as heroes. They aren't envisioning themselves when they think of what it means to be American because that's not what they're shown. We have entire generations shaped by the calculations they have to make in order to get by in white supremacy. I just met with middle schoolers in St. Louis at the middle school that Mike Brown went to. And they were amazing, delightful kids. Middle schoolers are wonderful, provided you're not parenting them. <laughs> It's a great place to visit and then leave. And these kids were laughing and joking and being, you know, 12 and 13 year olds. And then I asked them about a field trip they had taken to the white school across town. And the school they go to is majority black. It's got a small minority of Latinx kids and like According to them, five white kids. I don't know if they're exaggerating or not, but it really could be five white kids. I didn't see a single one when I was there, so. And this school looks like an industrial building. And it's got some windows that are taped up. It took me a while to get in because I had to stand in line at the metal detector. And these kids are laughing and frustrated, emptying their pockets and the guards, frustrated with them and telling them they should know the deal by now. 
They should have already had everything out of their pockets. And there's a grandpa in line in front of me waiting to pick up one of his grandchildren, and he keeps saying, these are our kids. These are our kids. And I finally get in, and I'm sitting, and I'm talking with these kids, and I'm asking them how their field trip went. And they were saying, oh, it was a blast. The white school has a pool. It had a theater. It had a bunch of really cool sports. It had a beautiful field. They had so much fun. They were wondering if maybe they'll let them go swim there sometime. And then they tell me about how on their way back, they stopped at a subway. And the teacher handed them all a bag of chips and then gave them five bucks to get their, you know, five dollar foot long. And the lady at the store accused one of the kids of stealing chips. And they were like, no, we didn't steal these chips. We got them from our teacher. But she was convinced this kid had stolen this bag of chips. And then the teacher had to come up and explain, no, I handed all of these kids chips. I can vouch for this kid. And it turns out that story didn't even sell that brand. But she had already threatened to call the police. And then I guess she just sat there and mean mugged these kids until they were done eating. And I was asking, you know, how that made them feel. They said they were trying to boycott that store, get their family not to go there. And then they were talking about how a few days later, one of the kids went in with some friends to the candy store. And he was holding candy in his hand, he went to pay for it, and he reached in for his wallet, and the clerk maced him in the face. And this kid, tiny kid, doesn't even look big for his age. Which I know because one of the kids being a middle schooler was like, no man, you should see him, He's only, you saw him, he just left, he's like four feet tall. And then the teacher was like, that's not nice. <laughs> he's not four feet tall. And his arm was in a sling, he had broken his arm and yet he was still a threat. I, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around the thought of a kid being maced in a candy store. Like that's the opposite of what we mean when we say like a kid in a candy store. It doesn't usually end with then, you know, that's not what we say when we've been maced. Oh, it's like I'm a kid in a candy store. And, and the thing about this was yeah, these kids were upset, but they were talking to me about it the way they would tell me about someone insulting them in the hall. You know, a bad day they had. There were no tears. There was no anguish. It was kind of life. And then one kid joked, she was like, yeah, this is why I always carry cash with me. My mom says it's bail money. Just keep it just in case. One kid commented, yeah, that's why I don't reach for, my you know, reach for anything in my pocket when I'm out in public. I don't want people to think I'm reaching for a weapon. This was also after they had told me about, one girl had told me how she had been given the option to leave her failing school, the school I was visiting, that has been unaccredited now for a couple years, um, and transfer to the white school. That was the solution given to parents. And she went for about half a year. But she had to leave because the teacher kept telling her that she wasn't speaking English. And she would say words like finna and ax. And she got tired of being interrupted when she would try to answer questions in class and told to speak properly. She had tried her best to relearn an entire language that didn't suit her the moment she got home, or the moment she was in her community. And eventually she just transferred back. And now she said, you know, she gets made fun of because she doesn't fit in anymore with the way she talks. And none of the issues that these kids face 
are because we haven't convinced enough people that racism is bad. These are systems harming these children. These are people knowing that they can act on their bias without consequence. These are systems reinforcing bias. These are school systems that tell teachers that you are doing your children a service by denying them the right to their language. These are systems saying that it's better to rip a child out of their community than to fix the school that they go to. So if it really is about systems, and it's not about hearts and minds, why is that not what we focus on? There's a couple of reasons. First, it's just not sexy. To, you know, who wants to have, what sounds like a better obituary? You know, she spent her day crusading to get people to understand the evils of racism, or she spent her day fighting with HR at her company trying to get better racial equity policies. <laughs> but also we have a history of viewing racism and racial oppression as a problem of the heart. When we think of the old days, even thinking of slavery, we think of hatred. We think of racist hate and violence. But what actually upheld the system of slavery? Was it that a bunch of colonists who had never interacted with black people in their life developed this grudge and then went overseas and decided to carry that out and get revenge on people they had never talked to before? And then they held on to that for another 400 years? Or was it a system that they were able to develop to easily exploit a population? And because it was easier to be brutal, because it was easier to say that people were inferior, that's what they did. Was it really the person shouting the racial slur at the slave while cracking a whip that was the problem? Or was it the textile mills that were weaving that cotton into cloth at cheap prices and pocketing those profits that was the problem? Was it the rest of the community that felt comfortable from that financial boom, that needed that financial stability, and turned their heads away at the brutality that maintained it, that was the problem. But when we talk about it in our books, we talk about the bad people who hated black people, who hated indigenous people, who hated Latinx people, and the good people that loved them. And then they went to war, and the good people won. And then there's a couple of bad people left over, and occasionally they put a sheet over their heads, they ride through town, they burn crosses, and they are the bad people. And one day when they are all gone, racism will no longer exist. We will all be free and equal. But even in the post-Reconstruction terror, what people feared most was not the KKK on horseback. First of all, they knew a good portion of them were their local sheriffs. They feared running into them anywhere. But it was how they were going to feed their families when no one would hire them. 
how they were going to teach their children to read when they couldn't get them into any schools, how they were going to be represented in government when they were being physically kept from voting. And so much of that is what we fear today. It's our fear of being dragged off and incarcerated, a fear of our children being undereducated, and knowing that educational success in this country means getting your degree in white supremacy. It's the fear of not having the representation to be able to effectively hold people accountable when entire communities go years without clean drinking water, to hold people accountable when our neighborhoods are underfunded, when our schools are underfunded. But all that we are told is that if we know that people of color are human beings and we love them, we've done our part. If you hear about the bad things that happen and you feel bad about it and you know that it's wrong, you've done your part. And a lot of people read my work for that. A lot of people read my work so they can have their cathartic cry and then they feel like they've done something. I have people who walk up to me still crying and telling me what a wonderful thing it is that I've made them cry. And I, I don't, that's not why I came here. <laughs> if people cry, they cry. But another reason why we don't like to view racial oppression as a function of systems and our participation in systems and instead like to make it about hearts and minds is because when we view it for what it actually is, it makes just about everyone complicit. Because we all interact with systems. We all have access to our local PTAs, to our school board meetings, to our city council meetings. Many of us have the right to vote. We have conversations with our bosses. We hire and fire people. Every day, we interact with dozens of systems. And in that interaction, where we spend our money, who we vote for, who we talk to, what conversations we decide not to have, we are choosing to use, abuse, or abdicate our power in those systems. When I talk about this, a lot of times people get frustrated. They think then I've made it too complex. It was easier when it was a problem of just, you know, calling that uncle that always says something racist at Thanksgiving and telling him it has to stop. And granted, you still need to do that. But if you think that it's harder and too complex, that really depends on your definition of hard and complex. Because to me, the idea that I have to go and win over the hearts and minds of racists in order to get a job interview, in order to fix a socioeconomic system that is disempowering me, in order to have representation in government, in order to have police accountability, the idea that that would require me in 2018 to be out convincing people that I'm a human being, that to me is too big. That to me is too complex. But knowing that I can ask my PTA why they aren't sending letters home in multiple languages to parents. Knowing that I could ask my HR manager 
what their policy for handling issues of racism and racial discrimination are, knowing that when someone running for city council knocks on my door, I can ask them what they're doing about police brutality, knowing that basically every system I interact with, anyone who wants my money, anyone who wants my time, can be someone I can task with helping me in making that system that they're in, that we're both in, more equitable. That to me is much simpler. Every day, there's a new opportunity. I get to be that really annoying person who stops every meeting, who stops almost every conversation, and points out what it means to the system. I mean, you should ask my kids. I don't let them enjoy anything. <laughs> every show we watch, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Did you see what happened right there? Did yeah. you see that? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, Mom, this is a cartoon. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> My son's teachers know. My mom, she's a member of her union. She's become that woman in her union. Whoever union meeting, she's asking how they're working racial equity into their charter. She's asking for updates on their progress. She's asking for feedback from the community. <coughs> Mostly she's asking it from me. She just sends it to me and asks me to look over it all the time. She's like, you're a writer. That is much simpler. My mom is actually a white woman, and we actually had, it's in the book too, kind of our, a couple of years ago, our real substantive talk. My mom loves black people, really, like almost to an embarrassing degree. <laughs> she loves that her children are black. She raised us full of pride of who we are. And there is real benefit to that. I am incredibly grateful. Not many mixed-race black kids have that experience. But now as an adult, um, she was pretty much convinced that that was what she needed to do, was to just go around telling everyone she loved her black kids. And in fact, the reason why we had this discussion was because she was thinking that was her in to a conversation on race, was just to explain how much she loves her black kids. And I was like, Mom. No, don't. Let's not do this. Let's have a better conversation about this. And she was frustrated because she saw what was happening to her children and her grandchildren. She saw the pain that we were having. And it hurt her, just like I'm sure it hurts many of you to see what's happening to people of color. And she would occasionally call me and tell me she loved me and she was proud of me and she wished the world was better. She wished, wished things weren't so racist. And that's all she could think of to do. Until I reminded her that she's a white woman, which she really did actually need a reminder of. <laughs> and that because she was in a system of white supremacy, and racial oppression. That meant that she actually had a lot of power and a lot of access. And that the only way she was going to be able to really help me was to stop thinking that her love was enough, that her well wishes were enough, and to start looking at how much power she had within our system and the opportunities that she had been letting pass by. And that's when she became the most annoying lady on her union. <laughs> and I was so proud of her. <laughs> but it matters, because she knows she can stand up in that meeting and bring up once again what they're doing to improve the number of employees of color and managers of color, what they're doing to increase the amount of translation services at their company. And she can do that without being written off as an angry black woman, which is how I would be treated. And so that's what she does. And she can have these conversations with people who are 
voicing racial bias and explaining to them the actual impact that that bias is having in their workplace, how it is denying services to people of color. Not just, oh, you're making people's feelings hurt. She can ask for greater accountability from her workplace. And she can do all of that because she stopped thinking that hearts and minds were enough. So the good news is that when we talk about the battle of hearts and minds when it comes to fighting racism and fighting racial oppression, that most of that battle's done. And I'm not saying that there's no racism and there's no bias. Oh, it's, our society's filled with it, absolutely filled with it. Uh, but also saying you love people of color, that doesn't actually do anything about that either. What I'm saying is, is that there's a majority of people in this country who know racism is bad, who know people of color are human beings. And that knowledge needs to be activated. It needs to be used. We spend so much time wondering what happened to this, these people that are virulent racists? What's gone wrong with all of these neo-Nazis? And, and I care. But also, I am not dedicating any time to winning them over. Because I have a majority of the population who's already won over and isn't doing jack. I like to say, I said this last year, I love, I, I love quoting myself, I don't do it enough. I mean, it's kind of a pretentious thing to do. <laughs> I wrote last year, and so I'm gonna update the year to make it more accurate. So, if in 2018, you think the world is flat, it's not because you haven't been given enough evidence. It's because you want to think the world is flat. Yeah. And so instead of dedicating our time to try to convince flat earthers that the globe is a somewhat accurate representation of the shape of this earth, <laughs> we can move on to brainstorming together about how to best live on this those of us who recognize the reality. We can get together and see how we are interacting with our systems every day and think of what we can do to make it more just, more equitable, what we can do to right wrongs. And this is something that should be empowering to you because it means that you can start today and have a measurable impact. It means your children can start today. The day after the election, I was heartbroken and scared. My children were heartbroken and scared. And I sat down and I explained to them the system that they live in and that they have power in. And I explained to them that even though it looked like the grown-ups had kind of screwed things up for them, and they had, that they still got to go to school the next day and help determine what was appropriate in their friend groups. They still got to go to school the next day and look through their textbooks and ask teachers questions about what they were or were not learning. And that one day they would inherit all of these systems. And by then they would have really great practice at asking the right questions at activating their privilege and using it to deconstruct systems of oppression. And if my 10-year-old can get that, and he can go to school and ask his teacher some tough questions, and he can start petitions, by the way, they've, their petition right now is for better non-dairy milk options. 
because a lot of kids of color are lactose intolerant and they do not like soy milk. <laughs> <clears throat> then so can we. It's not to say that I don't care about hearts and minds. I care what you do with it. I care what your love for humanity compels you to do. Your love is not enough on its own. Love is an action. Use your love to make you more aware. Use your love to motivate your work in our systems. Get your hearts and minds together to make us more safe. Use your love to make it so that those whose hearts and minds haven't been won over do not have the systemic power to end my life. Make it so that what is in the hearts and minds is limited to what's in the hearts and minds. And we don't have entire systems that take the bias and bigotry that can be found in the human imagination and writes into law. We can do this together. We are preaching to the choir. And it's just time to start singing a different song. Thank you.